I'm going to talk to you about five methods of learning Hebraically. Now, the Hebrew alphabet was a pictographic alphabet. It uh, originated like hieroglyphics. You know, on the Egyptian uh, pyramids, uh, they have lots of pictures, don't they? And that's a particular language. Well, the Hebrew language, very similar, it originated with pictures. And over the years, those pictures turned into letters. And so the letters still bear a great deal of resemblance to the original pictures. And also, this alphabet originated from their lifestyle. And we know that the, uh, the Hebrew culture uh, was uh, an agrarian culture. Initially they were nomads and then they uh, started to settle down. And so agriculture played a great part in um, their lifestyle and therefore the alphabet was brought about through that. And so um, these five methods of learning uh, are based on five letters out of the alphabet and I will just need my glasses. I've left up here somewhere. That's the ones. Anybody know what the first letter of the alphabet is, the Hebrew alphabet? Alpha. Alpha or Aleph. That's right. It's the first part. <laughs> well, it's the first part of alphabet, isn't it? Because the second one is bet, isn't it? And so alphabet is actually uh, uh, the first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And uh, and so the first letter is al aleph. And this um, is a very close word to the word aleph. And aleph means association. And so I want to show you five different ways of learning that aren't necessarily um, what's happening tonight. In other words, a lecture. So five different ways. And for us to understand, especially the teachers, that there's more ways of teaching uh, people and children especially than just telling them. And so it's important that we understand these uh, for us to be fruitful, for us to raise up the next generations, um, it, it's important that we understand this. And so this word, Aleph, means association. And the word Aleph, this first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, is a picture of an ox. And so, um, how does that fit in with association? Well, most of the time, if you see oxes at work, there tends to be two of them. And to get two oxes to work together, they put a yoke over the shoulders, don't they? And this yoke tended to be made out of wood. And, and so it held the two together. And those two oxen then had to pull um, whatever the load might be, whether it be a plough or some kind of cart or something like that. And... What they tended to do was they would stick a, a, an old ox with a young ox. Now maybe this will bring some uh, understanding to Sue why I called her an old ox not so long back. Uh, and she looked at me horrified because I was suggesting that we'd stick a young ox with an old ox. And so the young ox was going to be put with Sue, the old ox. And you see, so what they used to do, they would train a young ox by um, yoking them to an old ox. Now the young ox, it's going to be full of energy, and he wants to pull wherever it can, and the old ox, he's been at it for years. And he understands about pacing himself, he understands that if he does a good job, he's going to get fed at the end of the day. He understands all of the instructions, whereas the young ox doesn't. And so the way that the young ox learns is by being put in association with an old ox. Now you see, in industry, they understand this process. And so the whole concept of apprenticeship, putting a young 
a person with a, an older person that understands the trade inside out. That's the way that they do it in industry. The difficulty that we tend to find is that with the young ox, the young ox tends to be full of pride. The young ox thinks to itself, I know better than the old ox. I've got more strength. Uh, I know a better way. I'm going to teach this old ox how to do this in a better way. I'm going to do it quicker. And all of these thoughts that come to the young ox, and that happens whenever we face a situation where uh, a young person is put with an older person. And so part of the task is to deal with the pride. To bring that younger person to a place of humility where they actually understand there's a reason why they've been put with an older person. And it's because the older person has actually made all of those mistakes beforehand. And if the young ox is wise, it can learn from the old ox rather than going through all those problems himself. It's much better to learn by somebody else's mistakes than to learn by your own mistakes. So this whole concept of association, we find it is one of the best ways of teaching. And within the church we need to understand that association is taking place whether you like it or not. Because you see, people will learn from what you do, not so much from what you say. They're watching you. The, the word no in Hebrew is the word aoda, and it's very close to the word video. And to know has this connotation of to watch somebody's life, to observe them. To get to know someone, you observe them over a period of time. So you're watching what they do. You're watching how they respond in times of pressure. What is it that causes that person to come through and succeed when other people are falling? And so you watch over a period of time and you can get to know that person and you can learn. Now, if we're aware of that, we can use that to our benefit. When you're not aware of that, you don't realise that people are watching your life and they are liable to do what you do. So as a leader, if you've got problems in your life, what are you going to do? You're going to multiply those problems. The people that you raise up are liable to have the same problems. When I was trained as a driving instructor, one of the areas that I wasn't so good at, and I still aren't, is pulling up at a stop junction. Now, when you pull up at a stop junction, you're supposed to put your handbrake on. I never did, because I'd pull up to the junction, I'd have a quick look, and then off I'd go. Well, the first time I took a driving test as a driving instructor, guess what happened? I pulled up at a stop junction, I didn't put my handbrake on. The moment I put my foot on the accelerator, the examiner stopped the car. I failed. Just like that. Simply because I hadn't put my handbrake on. Why was it that I didn't do that? It was because the instructor that was taking me, obviously had a weakness in that area, and he didn't pull me up on it. He didn't notice it. He didn't impress it upon me, and because of that, the weakness he got in that area was multiplied into me. <coughs> you see, and so by association with that particular driving instructor, it meant I failed my first uh, instructor's uh, driving uh, test, which was a real blow to me. And you know, that was one of the hardest things I, I faced uh, of going through this uh, driving instructing training because you have to sit with an experienced driving instructor who pulls your driving apart. And when we've been driving for a while, especially us men, we all think we're the best drivers in the world, and uh, suddenly being faced with a mock test and 15 fails on it, as a, someone who's been driving for 20 years, I, you think, this guy's having a go with you, this isn't right. How can he have failed me that many times for all of that? 
and, and it, it's right. And so it pulls your driving apart. It destroys your driving and then builds it back up again. Do you know that's a picture of the true meaning of repentance? Going back to the Hebrew alphabet, uh, the word repentance is actually a combined picture of a house on fire. So true repentance means that your old house is destroyed and you have to build a new one. See, repentance doesn't mean that you're sorry. Repentance means that you no longer do that and you have a completely new way of doing things. You see? That's quite a different way to how it's taught in the church nowadays where people think to repent, you just got to make out you're a bit sorry. Well, that doesn't count. Repentance, true repentance is you don't do it again. That's it. It's finished. You live a completely new life. That's the challenge that we face. And that's there in this picture of a house on fire. You can learn a lot through these letters and through the Hebrew alphabet. Hallelujah. Amen. So, to learn by example. In 2 Kings chapter 2, we've got Elijah and Elisha. How many people have been to a, uh, a meeting where uh, they've uh, declared that it's a double anointing night? That if you come down the front, you're going to pray and you can receive a double anointing. Not been to one of them? No. Well, they used to be quite popular. The idea that you can come down the front, somebody lay their hands on your head and you get a double anointing. Along the basis that Elisha, when Elijah was being taken off to heaven, uh, because he got the, uh, the mantle, Elisha ended up with a double anointing. They, they tend to forget that Elisha spent the best part of 20 years working as Elijah's servant. And that that's where the double anointing came from, not just from picking up a, a mantle on one particular day. But Elijah and Elisha were yoked together. And over a long period of time, the old prophet raised up the young prophet. You see how it happened? Same with Paul and Timothy. The old apostle raised up the young apostle. And so, when we've been teaching here about the fivefold ministry's task is to raise up uh, God's people for acts of service, to raise up the next generation, <coughs> that's exactly it. God's got somebody to yoke with you. Somebody for you to start to pour your life into, for you to start to raise up. That's the way that God does things. And so understanding association. One area that you might have forgotten, and the people that associate with you the most, and therefore will learn from you in this way the most, the little people that tend to get bigger, they're your children. And the danger is that we have two faces. We can have one face for church, and then we've got one face for home, and the children see two faces, and they don't know which one's the right one. That's why I say to you that we're called to live seven days a week, 24 hours a day, Christian life. That one day a week, Sunday, isn't any good. That's hypocrisy. If you put on a special face for Sunday, that's hypocrisy. The way that your children see you is the way that you are, not how you are on Sunday. I'd much prefer that you come to church the way that you really are, because then we can see who you really are, and then we can help you in that particular way, rather than putting on a face. The, the Sunday go-to meeting, best clothes, face washed, smiling face, which is a picture of how you think you are supposed to look. But it isn't the real you. So you need to understand that your children are learning by association, they are learning what you are doing at home. So not only do I know what is in your heart, because I listen to what comes out of your mouth, I know what's in your heart because I listen to what comes out of your children's mouth. I can learn a great deal about you by looking at your children. You see? And so you need to understand 
This is one of the major ways of learning it is by association. So in terms of how can you make use of association, well, it's spending time with people, isn't it? It's sharing precious moments of your life with other people. And in that time, then you can be transferring information to people. You can be transferring what you've learned. Being there at times when people are going through difficult times and sharing with them how you've managed to overcome those various problems. It's testifying about your own life and it's being truthful. It's, it's talking about how when you face those problems, how you originally thought. Not how they expect you thought. Being real of if you were full of fear, if you were terrified about what the situation was. You've got to talk about how you really were at the beginning of that because more than likely that's how those people already are at that time. And so they need to know that there's not something wrong with them. That's actually how you were, but this is what you did. And you came out of it. So it means that learning by association means you have to show people your true face. <laughs> You have to be honest with them. If you're not honest, then people will see through that. And they won't really take notice of what you're saying because they'll be watching what you're doing. So it's a very important method of learning, association. <clears throat> Proverbs 22, Verses 24 and 25 say, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways, that's Allah, and get a snare to thy soul. So in terms of association as well, you need to listen to the Holy Spirit who you are supposed to be yoked to. We know the scripture that says that we shouldn't be yoked with unbelievers. Now, we assume that means that you shouldn't get married to a non-Christian. So that's true. But there's a lot of unbelievers in churches. So it doesn't necessarily mean to say that you should marry somebody in church. You might be marrying an unbeliever that is putting on a Sunday go to meeting face. So you need to watch the life, don't you? You need to understand that you become like those that you spend time with. This is the whole basis of this association that I'm talking about. When you understand that, you'll start to see the power there is in choosing who you associate with. Now, uh, years ago, before I became a Christian, I used to do a lot of sales training. I used to buy lots and lots of tapes and... Uh, most of them were American tapes by very successful salesmen. And uh, there was a chap called Dale Carnegie, who was a Christian. He, he built 200 odd churches. Uh, I don't know what kind of Christian he was, but uh, um, he was a very, very rich man. And one of the principles that he came up with was called um, mastermind groups. And a mastermind group was a group of people that were successful in a particular area and they would gather together on a fairly regular basis and they would encourage each other and they would share testimonies of how they overcome in various situations. And they found that mastermind groups had the effect of moving the whole group on. And so that's a principle that if you got into sales training you could spend three or four thousand pounds for seminars uh, on a weekend and they'll teach you mastermind groups. Now the same thing happens in athletics or in sports. You find um, that our good athletes tend to be uh, invited to go and join a group that uh, run in uh, America or in Africa somewhere and they go to a group of athletes that are running at higher levels than they are. And when they go and join this group, when they first start, they think this is impossible. These guys are running at a level I can't do that. It's not physically possible to run that fast 
How can these guys do that? But over a period of time, because they start to train with them, they pick up the same habits, they start to pick up the same mindset, a time comes when they get dragged up to the same level and they start running on that same level. And so these groups of association, when you see it, you understand that you become like those that you associate with. Now the, scripture, the scriptures say that bad company corrupts good morals. So not only does this work in a positive way, but it works in a negative way as well. So if you get drawn into spending a lot of time with people that are very negative, that are fearful, are unbelieving, they've got bad ways about them, then what will happen is that you will be drawn into how they are like. It is just what happens with association. It's the importance of choosing your friends wisely. Choosing who you associate with. Can you see that? Smile at me. Yes. This is good news because you're learning it. If you find this out when you get to heaven, it's too late. If you find it out now, you can do something about it. It might mean that you've got some hard decisions to make. You might have to cut some people out of your life. Or at least push them to the, the boundaries uh, and not spend much time with them. If they say, why don't you want to spend much time with me? You might tell them the truth. Because this is how you're acting. And I can't associate with people that are like that. So association. A major way of learning Hebraically. The second one is the word lamad. Which means instruction. And lamad, the, uh, the picture for lamad is of a stick. So, if you think about a shepherd, he has his rod and his staff. Uh, cow herds have a big stick. And so what do they do? You've got uh, a number of sheep or a number of cattle that are walking along a path. And the person that's responsible for them, how do they keep them on the path? Now I could ask Moose, because Moose used to do that, didn't she? You know, your mum used to do that. Uh, I used to work on a, a dairy farm. I used to live right next to one. I didn't, they never gave me a big stick. But, uh, my job wasn't herding the cattle. But what they do to keep them on the path, they use the big stick and they tap them. If they're going across to the right and they don't want them going over to the right, they tap them on the right side so they move back over. Or they tap them on the left side. The same with the, a shepherd does the same thing. And so... What, how does that equate to instruction? It means setting boundaries. Our task is to set boundaries for people's lives. One boundary is that if you put on a prayer school and it starts at one o'clock, you expect people to be there for one o'clock. So if they don't get there for one o'clock, what's the pastor's task with the big stick? Tell people you are late and you shouldn't be late and explain why. You see, setting boundaries. Your children, if you say bedtime's eight o'clock and eight o'clock comes and guess what? There's something wonderful on the television. Dad, Dad, I want to watch this just tonight, only tonight. No, your bedtime's eight o'clock. That's the boundary we set. That's the boundary. And you need to understand the way that children are, children always push the boundaries. Doesn't matter where you set the boundary, they will push it. Right? They will come up to that boundary and say, we need, we want to do this. We want just this once, and if you give in just once, then next time, as far as they're concerned, the new boundary is now 10 past 8. Then the new boundary is now 20 past 8. Because they push the boundaries, and those boundaries have now furthered. And so you need to understand that when you set a boundary, it's only a boundary when you enforce that boundary and you maintain it. If you don't, then what will happen is your children don't believe you. Because they know that they can push the boundaries by putting enough pressure on you, there will be a new boundary which they're much happier with for a while. 
until then they want to push the boundary again. And so you need to understand, instruction is setting boundaries and sticking to those boundaries. It doesn't work if you set those boundaries and then you just allow them to do whatever they want. And you know, your children only really know that you love them when they see that you correct them. Do you know, it's much harder to correct your children than not to. But the father says that evidence that he loves us is that he corrects us. And so in families and within the church as a wider family, correction has to be a part of a loving attitude. We have to see the consequence of not correcting people. And this is where there can come a difference between men and women. And again, you need to understand that with families, the mother tends to be the major uh, member of the partnership for children up to the age of 12. Because there's a nurturing that's taking place and a comforting of those children. But at about the age of 12, the emphasis starts to change over to the father. And it's because the father then has to start to uh, exert discipline and start to develop character in those children. And so there's a, a changing of emphasis in, um, in what takes place in families. And that is an aspect of blessing. And the devil understands that. And so the devil exerts all of the pressure that he can to split families up before the children get to the age of 12. Because if he can do that, if he takes the father out of the equation, he's taken a major part of God's way of blessing out of that family. And the devil doesn't have to do that much more after that because he's messed up the system sufficiently that those children are unable to be blessed to the level that they were supposed to be. Unless godly parenting comes in again. And so that's an aspect in the church. This is why there's been a big move called the Father's Art Movement. Uh, and for the, the church to understand the need of godly parents. Godly fathers that exert discipline uh, and correction. But in the right way, in a loving way. Not in a heavy handed way. Not in a way that takes away um, everybody's uh, free will. But demonstrates that there are boundaries and that you need to stick to those boundaries, and that those boundaries are important. And one of the concepts you really need to get is that the Bible says that there is a broad way and there is a narrow way, and that we are called to walk on the narrow way, and we should determine that we're going to walk in the middle of the narrow way, because if you determine that you're going to walk on the edge of the narrow way, you're always in danger of falling off. Can you see that? If you determine to walk in the centre of the narrow way, that's the safest place to be. But if you in your heart, you're always wanting to push the boundaries, you're always want to, wanting to rebel, you're always wanting to question, if you're constantly um, uh, causing problems in the church, you are right on the edge of that narrow way and you are in danger of falling off. That's not clever. It's not clever. You need to see the best place you can be is in the centre of the narrow way, not on the edge. Don't go pushing the boundaries. Understand the boundaries are there for your best. Hallelujah. Amen. The verb lamad means to direct or to learn by showing the direction. So pointing the way, demonstrating the boundaries. In scripture here, Deuteronomy 4.10, Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, when he said to me, Assemble the people before me to hear my words, so that they may learn, that's lamad, to revere me as long as they live in the land. And may teach, that's Lamad, them to their children. So, once you understand the importance of boundaries, you need to pass on those boundaries. And again, you'll find it in the Bible that uh, the ancient paths 
the ancient um, bridal ways and so on, God counts them as very important. And when people start to move them, it has knock-on effects. And it's been interesting that uh, as Jonathan's been doing some work here, one of the things he's been doing, he's been uncovering the old paths. If you go outside there, you'll see the, the paths that have been uncovered. They'd overgrown over the years, the grass had grown over them. Uh, and it's trying to do it again now. But uh, there's a lot more of the paths that are uncovered. And uh, many years ago, I, I came across a book by a chap called Craig Hill. And last night I just bought another book of his, which will come through in a, another week or so. Um, but he had a, a book called The Ancient Paths. The scripture says, call for the ancient paths. Uncover the ancient paths. The old ways of doing things. There was a reason why uh, the Hebrews and the Jewish nations, God blessed them and that they tended to be the richest of all people. Um, do you know the, the number of Nobel Peace Prize winners that are uh, Jews is amazing in comparison to Muslims, for example. I don't think there is any. If there is, there's one or two. But there's probably hundreds that were Jews. Same with the uh, inventors and um, creating all kinds of uh, new things. Anything that comes by revelation, because they're still in tune with God and his old ways, uh, God is able to drop inventions into their hearts, into their minds. Uh, <clears throat> so, the ancient paths, the old ways, not only are you to find these paths, but you need to pass them on. You need to guard them. To the extent that you see that they are important is the extent that the next generation will see that they are important. If you don't think that they are important, they won't. The next one is the word yara. And this means direction. Uh, the word yara was uh, based on the concept of throwing a rock or firing an arrow. And uh, you'd find this in 1 Samuel 20, 20. This was um, uh, David and Jonathan, if I remember right. He says, I will shoot, that's Yara, three arrows on the side thereof, as though I shot at a mark. This was when uh, Jonathan's father was uh, after killing David. And Jonathan went to his father just to make certain what was going on. And he said to David, if, uh, if he's after killing you, I'll shoot some arrows in this particular place. So you'll know that you need to run away. And so that's what he did. So shooting an arrow or throwing a rock at a target. And so this is goal setting. Learning by setting goals. Understanding the importance of having a vision. The scriptures say where uh, there is no vision, my people cast off restraint. In other words, it means if you haven't got a vision, then you won't put any effort in. You will think, what's the point? There's no point in me being disciplined. I can just do whatever I feel like. And so having a vision, having a goal is vitally important. And again, in sales training and within industry, you could go to seminars where they will charge you £3,000 for a weekend. Uh, and they will teach you goal setting. And two major aspects of goal setting. One is that it is achievable. And secondly, that it is incremental. So that you recognise that there are uh, a number of goals. That you can see that there are steps up the mountain. You remember I say to you, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. How do you climb a mountain? One step at a time. And so how do you achieve great goals? One small goal at a time. So understanding the importance of goal setting. The number of studies that there have been of uh, young people that have left school and out of 100 people that left school, they looked at them 25 years later, and of the very few percent that set goals, they were always far and away 
more successful than those that didn't set goals. So having a vision, being focused on it, it's a major aspect of motivation. And one of the things I found most difficult with training up young men to become window cleaners and training up sons is finding how to motivate them. I found there's two types of people. There are those that need a job and there are those that can run a business. What's the difference between the two? Those that can run a business are self-motivated. If you can't motivate yourself, then you need a job. Because somebody else has to wield a big stick. So if you want to know how to become successful in your life, one of the first areas is learning how to motivate yourself. How to get up in the morning. How to go out to work. How to go when it's raining, when it, the, the snow's uh, two foot thick. When everybody else is lying in bed and you're the one that's there. And the boss notices and thinks to himself, right, next time I'm promoting someone, that's the one. It also means throwing out the finger so you point in a direction. You find that one in Exodus 15, verses 24 and 25 throwing out of the finger. This must be it. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed Yara, that is, showed him a tree, which he had cast into the waters. The waters were made sweet. There he had made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. It can also mean to learn by pointing out the way. Showing people the way. After the first few years of being a window cleaner, because I was doing a good job in comparison to the other people that were around about, I, I started to get a lot of customers. And that meant that I needed to have young men to come and work with me. And so I was then faced with the task of learning how to teach them, to train them. And uh, I also came across the concept that was very difficult for me to understand at the time, and that was I was a hopeless teacher. Because when a young man came to work with me, I would stand in front of a window, and at that time we used to use applicators and squeegees, and so I would clean the window at full speed, and then say to him, right, you do it. And so we'd pick up the applicator that he'd never picked up before, and he'd soak the window and he'd get it far too close to the edges, he'd get soap all over the edges. He, he, uh, and, and so he'd do that and then he'd get the squeegee, which he'd never picked up before, he'd put it on the window and he'd move it about some way and when he finished, he left a right mess. And I looked at him and I thought, are you thick? I've just shown you. And so I'd do it again. I'd probably do it faster this time because I'm annoyed with him, right? So I'd go, Shh. there you go, do it. So he'll go, and he's under pressure now, because I'm annoyed at him. And so the second time, he'd make an even worse mess than he did the first time. And I said, are you thick? And I'm thinking of sacking him, and he's only been with me for five minutes. And it didn't occur to me that I hadn't got the faintest idea about a teaching. You see? Now, when I went to become a driving instructor, I'm faced with the same concept of how to teach somebody to drive. Now, we can assume that the way to teach somebody to drive is let them sit next to you and you just drive. Doing everything at full speed and thinking that just letting them watch it is going to be sufficient for them to understand how to drive a car. They've got some basic concept, they've got to put their feet on these pedals, they've got to move this lever about somehow, and they've got to steer like that. And they could sit there and if you didn't do anything, they'd crash. Now, what I was taught was that we had to break it down into every single movement that was involved in driving a car. You had to break it right down to that and show them in order, in sequence, what they needed to do. And bit by bit, they learnt the sequence and then they developed the skill to be able to do it smoothly. And that's what takes place. One of the ways they demonstrated to us how to do that concept was they asked us 
as a, a group um, to explain to someone that was coming out of an equatorial rainforest how to make a cup of tea. Now making a cup of tea is a very simple process for us, isn't it? But if you come out of a rainforest and you have never met electricity, you've never seen a kettle, you don't know what a cup is and you don't know what tea is, explaining to them every one of the steps that's involved in making a cup of tea, suddenly you start to think to yourself, hang on, making a cup of tea isn't quite as simple as I thought it was. And so starting to see all of the steps that are involved and writing them down in the right sequence and being able to explain to them what a, a kettle is. You've never seen a kettle, so you would know uh, how to pick a kettle up, how to put water in it, where the water comes from. All, everything like that that's involved needs to be explained to them in sequence so that they can start to build up what we would describe as a very simple task. That's part of this instruction. It's understanding. Within the church, that's what we're facing. And so, we have somebody that comes into the church as a, a non-Christian. They get saved. We might have been in the church 20 years. God has changed us dramatically over 20 years, uh, bit by bit. It's taken 20 years for us to get to where we are now. Somebody's been in the church two days, and we look at them, and we expect them to live the same level of Christian life as we do after two days <coughs> and to help them we explain to them how to do it it's not going to happen is it if it's taken God 20 years to get us to that point how can we expect that person to get to the same place where we have in two days it's not going to happen is it can you, can you see that we can have an expectation on new Christians that is impossible? That they can't live that lifestyle in two days. It's going to take them a long time to get to the point where we are. And so God has been very patient and persevering with us. And we've got to be patient and persevering with them, haven't we? Hallelujah. Amen. We're not far off finish now. Exodus 24, verse 12. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone, and a law, and a commandment, which I have written, that thou mayest teach. Yara. Teach them. Pointing the finger. Pointing the finger and writing it out. Writing out instructions. Writing out sufficiently... Uh, Detailed instructions that people can follow. It's the responsibility of parents to point the way to children. Setting goals for your children is an excellent way of teaching them and helping them to learn how to motivate themselves. See how happy that you can be when you reach a goal. Understanding that one of the major ways of motivation is when you set a goal, if you also set a reward for meeting that goal within the time period and a punishment for not reaching that goal within the time period and setting the reward and the punishment at levels that mean something to you. So there's no point in setting a, a reward of one pound for doing a major task. It's got to be something that is significant, that is going to motivate you. It's going to help you to, to focus on um, keeping concentrated on doing that particular thing. Because it's going to involve discipline, isn't it? Yeah. You've just got to understand the way that human beings are and how you can work in line with that that enables you to fulfil these tasks. Once you start to do that and you see the, the effect of being disciplined and reaching incremental goals, when you understand that, then you see there's a whole power in that process. And those that start to do that, when they come out of school, they will succeed far and away above those people that don't put in any goals or motivate themselves in that kind of way. 
It's your choice whether you want to have a job or whether you want to run a business. And you won't make a lot of money if you are in a job. The richest people in the world always own businesses. So there's a reward. Hallelujah. Amen. We're on to the last two and then we'll be finished in a short while. Uh, the fourth one is Shanan. And this means skills. It means to learn by sharpening. The word literally means to make pointed or to sharpen, such as a knife or a sword. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 41 says, When I sharpen, that's Shanan, my flashing sword, and my hand grasps it in judgment, I will take vengeance on my adversaries and repay those who hate me. <clears throat> There's other scriptures that talk about sharpening a dull axe. And a story about two men going out to cut, cut down a tree, or to cut down a, a number of trees, and one just takes his axe and starts hammering away at the trees. The other guy sits down with, uh, so, with a stone and with some oil and starts to sharpen the axe. And he's there for 20 minutes sharpening his axe. The other one's already cut down one tree, and he's thinking, that guy's dead. Spending all that time sharpening in his axe. But over a period of time, the guy with the sharp axe starts to catch up and get past. Sharpening the axe is a picture of sharpening your skills. You know, I've talked to you about David when he was looking after the sheep. Now, David could have just thought to himself, I've got a dead end job here looking after sheep. Huh. You know, throw a few stones at things and whatever, lots of sleep. But he didn't do that. What did he do? He sharpened his skills. Didn't he? he learned how to play the guitar, the light. And he also started to sing songs. And he developed his relationship with the Lord. And there's a scripture that says that uh, a man's gift brings him before kings. I, I like to say a well-developed gift will bring you before important people. And the consequence of David's well-developed gift was that he was brought before the king to play his guitar to drive away the evil spirit. And it enabled him to go into the palace and it was the beginnings of his career, wasn't it? The well-developed gift. So that you don't waste your time in the, the time that you've got that you start to sharpen your skills. Because God gives you gifts but he expects you to develop them. And so it's no excuse when the skill that you've been given isn't developed to the point where it's going to open the door for you. Somebody sees how well you do something, it opens the door for you. It could be the way that you get out from that level. It could be the door opener, the gateway, a well-developed gift, sharpened up. We know about uh, iron sharpens iron, don't we? Um, and so part of the task within church um, of fellowship is that at times you will rub up against other people. Uh, if you see iron sharpening iron, you'll see the sparks. And so sometimes in church, uh, in fellowship, sparks fly between people. Um, there can be disagreements about various things, and that can be a good thing. It's a good thing if you bring it before the Lord, and you, um, you deal with those problems, you deal with those differences. So iron sharpening iron, it can end up with the rough edges being smoothed off of it. And if you remember about David uh, and the five stones that were put in his pouch, can you remember what was significant about the five stones? They were smooth. They were smooth. And how did they get smooth? They'd been in the river a long time. And they were bouncing up against other stones. So that's a picture of when you're in church, you're bouncing up against other Christians, and at times you have disagreements. You overcome those disagreements, you come back into agreement, and both of you have had a rough edge uh, knocked off. And you start to become a smooth stone. A time comes when God picks you up and puts you in his pouch and says, right, you're smooth enough now for me to be able to use you. Hallelujah. <coughs>
Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently, this is the word Shanan, unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy, thine house, and when thou walkest up by thy way, and when thou liest down, and when thou, thou risest up. Developing your skills. Hallelujah. Every one of you, you've got a gift, at least one gift. And again, if you know the Bible stories, there was a story about three different men. They got uh, different levels of talents. One had got five talents, one had got three, and one had got one. The one that had got one talent didn't do anything about it, and the Lord described him as an evil and wicked servant. He was lazy. The other two, both of them did something with their talents, and it was added to them. And so, don't go getting jealous of somebody that's got a lot of gifts. Be faithful with the, the, the gift that you've got, and God will add more to you. Amen. That's the answer. Amen. Be faithful, and God will promote you. He'll give you more gifts, more abilities. Hallelujah. Amen. Last word is the word yasar, and it means discipline. Discipline. Hallelujah. And the word actually means to turn the head. And uh, I need uh, a young person, someone like Daniel, to come and help me demonstrate this. Come on down. Hallelujah. Okay. What I want you to do is look in that video camera there. Okay. Right. Now, where's your mum? There. No, I said look in the video camera there. Where's your mum? There. Right, that's right. Turn the head. Focus. Discipline. Right. Distraction. That's his mum. Discipline. That's the video camera. Right. Distraction. That's where my food is, but that's where my discipline is. Right. You get it? Discipline. Distraction. Discipline. Distraction. Well done. So my task is to grab you by the ears and focus you, isn't it? My task is to say to you, this is important, that's distraction. This is important, this is distraction. Get here on time, because if you don't, you're setting yourself up for a ministry of sitting, waiting for other people. Wondering why it is that no matter how much you rebuke them, they don't get there on time. Discipline. Discipline in your life. Recognising what causes you to be late. And changing it. No matter what it costs. Understanding the importance. Because if you don't. You will never be able to have a ministry that starts on time. You'll never be able to have a church that starts on time. You have to see the importance of discipline and distraction. What is distracting you from being there? Uh, I've tried to explain before, I said when I, I taught this at Sunnys, I can imagine somebody who's in a sales job and they've got the opportunity to go in and see a large client and win a contract for a million pounds. And the the reward for getting this contract is £10,000. It's going to take an hour to do the presentation. And if they say yes, then they earn £10,000 for doing an hour's work. And they get there 10 minutes late and the secretary won't even let them in through the door. So being late for 10 minutes means More than likely, in a couple of days' time, there'll be a football player that wants to move for a, an enormous amount of money, but the contract doesn't get signed before the 12 o'clock deadline, and they can't do it, and they miss out on a fortune. There was one guy last year, I think his name was Adam Wingy, from West Brom. He, he drove all the way up to some place 
thinking he was going to get a contract and they hadn't got any knowledge of him going up there. Uh, and he drove up there and he drove back down again, caused lots of problems. But he didn't manage to do it. You've got to see the benefit of discipline. Well, I say, you could spend three or four thousand pounds and you could go to seminars and I can guarantee you what they would teach you is what I've just taught you in an hour. I saved you three thousand pounds. Right? Because this is the kind of stuff that is in industry and they teach to people and the people that do those things get to the top. Because, you know, the only things that work are God's principles. If you want to know something that works uh, constantly, it's God's principles. You can manage to hoodwink people for a short period of time, but eventually they caught on on. The only thing that works constantly are God's principles. And these are God's principles. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> the word can be translated as chastise or discipline. Scripture, Proverbs 29, 17 says, Correct, that's Yassar thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Remember what I said, that your children know that you love them because you discipline them. Mm. And you have to understand that you have to discipline in love. Amen. But faced with the choice of not disciplining, of letting them off, that is not loving. God has given you the task of setting these young people on the path of their life. And if you do that correctly, they will be successful. If you don't, then that's what happens. That's the reason why you find the people that become thieves, become um, drug addicts, all of those kind of things. What's happened is they haven't had the discipline in their life. And then they start to get desires for things that they know that there's no way that they can earn that. that. Mm. And so they go and steal it. Hallelujah. So I'll just uh, remind you of these words if you were writing that down. The first one is the word Aleph. And it means to learn by yoking. That means that God has got someone to uh, associate closely with. This is discipleship. This is mentoring. Developing the next generation. The second word is the word lamad. It means to learn by goading. That's setting boundaries. 10.30 is when church starts. If you're late, then I'll get on your back. If you don't like it, there are plenty of other churches that start at half past ten and you could be late for them. Because I won't be able to do anything with you if you're constantly late. And that's, so that's instruction. Yara. To learn by pointing or setting goals. That's giving direction. That's understanding the importance of having a vision. Remember those of you that have got ministries. Why I ask you to tell me every now and again what the vision is for your ministry. I want you to keep telling me, and each time you tell me, I want to hear more of what the vision is. Because I know when you can tell me more of that vision, you've got closer to it. You've seen more. Hallelujah. Amen. Shanan means to learn by sharpening. That's developing your skills. Understand that God's given you a gift, but it's your responsibility to develop it. And the last one is the word yesar. And it means to learn by chastisement, by discipline. 